Thank you, um, staff, for really good food and service. Appreciate it. Thanks. And now we're pleased to have um, Kevin Van Hooser with an after dinner talk from physics to metaphysics, imagining the world that scripture imagines. So um, Kevin will come and um, give us his talk. And then after that, um, we'll, we should have time for some questions and he'll field those and then we'll close for the evening. So thanks, Kevin. Thank you, you have a handout, and uh, now you have to pay for your dinner. <laughs> C.S. Lewis was ahead of his time in writing dystopian fiction. He took his title for the third volume of his space trilogy, That Hideous Strength, from a 16th century poem, which refers to the Tower of Babel, whose shadow is said to be six miles long. If we knew where it was and the time of day, we could no doubt calculate the exact height if we were good at geometry. In Lewis's book, the tower shadow is represented by the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments, or NICE for short. And that hideous strength is the ideology of materialist naturalism, the notion that nothing exists apart from physical matter and energy and that reality is there to be manipulated by those who know how to do so. Pastors and churches today confront a similar hideous strength because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, matter in motion, but against isms and ideologies, against the powers that seek to name and control reality. When we think about the authority of science and the gravitational hold its picture of the universe has on people's imaginations, we may indeed feel that there are giants in the land. The pastor is a little bit like David against a secularizing Goliath. The historical Goliath, too, had a hideous strength, brute physical strength enhanced by technological superiority helmet of bronze, coat of mail, bronze armor on his legs, a shield bearer who went before him, and a massive spear with an iron head. The personification of the state of the art of military science of his day, a one-man weapon of mass destruction. We minister in a world where authority has shifted away from scripture and tradition towards reason and experience. Listen to T.H. Huxley's generalization, as brash as it is hasty. He says, history records that whenever science and orthodoxy have been fairly opposed, the latter has been forced to retire from the lists, bleeding and crushed, if not annihilated. Is that a right picture of the situation? Is the science theology relationship a monologue in which science always has the advantage when the topic is reality? We need to first clarify the question. The issue isn't about science and theology in the abstract, but rather about specific findings in specific sciences and how they relate to specific theological doctrines. But can theology ever talk back to science? I think we need to proceed really cautiously here, but Spoiler alert, yes. When science is successful, think about the Copernican Revolution, what it's trumped is not scripture itself, but our interpretations of scripture. But does science always trump our theological interpretations? Well, David was a shepherd, and he was used to defending his flock against fearsome threats, lions and bears and such like. And he saw Goliath, an uncircumcised Philistine, as comparable to those other beasts. He went head to head with Goliath, but not with the same weapons. He chose five smooth stones to use with his sling. And the rest, as they say, is flannel board Sunday school history. <laughs> I want to provide tonight five smooth stones for pastors to use with, in their own battles with the giants in today's cultural landscape. 
Let me assure you straight away, I have no intention of getting into the debate as to whether God created the stones smooth or whether they became so over millions of years. <laughs> My argument doesn't depend on the relative age of the earth, you'll be glad to know. But it does depend on correctly identifying the giant that we're confronting and on encouraging pastors to use the stones that we'll be looking at. As we'll see, that hideous strength is no match for shepherds who wield the word of God. So the first stone, and each of these stones is an exhortation. The first stone is, resist reductionism. The book of Proverbs tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And this is as true in the realm of science as in theology. Nothing rebuffs human pride as effectively as the distinction between creator and creature. It's salutary to remember that we don't have the creator's point of view on the world unless God reveals it to us. But then again, neither does science. One thing I think pastors can do for congregations is to alert them to the danger of reductionism, this prideful tendency to explain everything in terms of something. Reductionism is that myopic tendency to explain complex phenomenon in terms of something simpler, the concepts of one academic discipline only. This is a massive simplification, and it results in a distortion of reality. Reality is going to be the operative term tonight. Both science and theology claim to have a purchase on reality, but it does seem today that all too often science has the superior position. It seems that it can see further and deeper into the sinews of the natural world, piercing, yes, even to the division of joints and marrow. So we need to beware of reductionism, but let me say straight away, I welcome science's genuine insights into the natural world. What I think we need to be careful about is the tendency of some scientists to claim too much for their theories, as if everything could be explained in terms of, say, physics. And here I'm following Arthur Peacock, a Christian physicist, who argues that reality is stratified in a hierarchical way, and that no one level of reality, say the physical, no one level as reality is more real than another. There's a complex stratified hierarchy of being and a hierarchy of disciplines, as it were, that corresponds to these different levels of reality. Entities on the higher levels depend on what's below them. So a, a cell is going to be made up of atoms. The tools that a, chemistry, a chemist uses uh, interact with what a physicist is doing, but a chemist says more than a physicist because he's looking at a more complex level of reality. But you can't explain everything that's going on on a higher level in terms of lower levels. That is the reductionist move. So, for example, to do justice to mental health, we should include an examination of one's brain chemistry uh, from time to time, even of those who hold eye office. But it would be misleading to say that psychology pertains to nothing but brain chemistry, as if persons were no more than biological organisms. So I'm suggesting that we need to resist this tendency to flatten a complex, multi-leveled reality into one level only, to which one particular science would give us the keys of the kingdom. As Alistair McIntyre says, from the standpoint of physics, human beings are composed of fundamental particles, interacting in accordance with the probabilistic generalizations of quantum mechanics. But from the perspective of chemistry, human persons are the site of chemical interactions, assemblages of elements and compounds. From the perspective of biology, we are multicellular organisms belonging to species, each of which has its own evolutionary past. From the perspective of historians, we're intelligible only as emerging from long histories of social and economic transformations. 
from the perspective of economists. We're rational profiteers. And from the perspective of psychology and sociology, we shape and are shaped by our perceptions, our emotions, and our social roles. But how do these all relate to one another, he asks, and what does the unity of a human being consist? I think it's appropriate that the focus this year of the Creation Project is indeed theological anthropology. The human person, after all, is a microcosm, a gathering place of all levels of created reality. And I also believe that in the years ahead, the real flashpoint between science and theology will concern not the origins of the cosmos or even the origins of biological life, but rather the nature of humanity. The real danger in the years ahead is a reductionism in our theories about what it is to be human. By reducing things to mere nature, we may be able to conquer nature, and yet the final stage of that reduction is the reduction of our own species to humanity, to the level of mere natural object. Yes, we are beings made up of matter, chemicals, and organic tissue, but we're more than that. Now, I'm not going to pick a fight with physics all night, so I'll give an example of another reductionism from biology, E.O. Wilson's theory of sociobiology. This attempts to explain sociological phenomena in terms of biological categories. I think this is a classic example of disciplinary pride that tries to look at everything from one level of reality only. It's interesting that Wilson himself was an entomologist specializing in ants, and that gave him a special insight, I think, into human sociology, or so he thinks. The findings of science are always fragmentary, though, because a particular science is usually attuned to a particular aspect of reality. Again, it's very helpful to have people attuned to these levels so long as they know their place. <laughs> the natural sciences gaze at the material and empirically verifiable. The human sciences look at this or that aspect of human behavior. What about theology? What does it look at? It should be interested in all aspects of human being and, and how they can be integrated in light of the claim that Jesus Christ is the true human being. That's what theology ought to do. I also want to admit that theologians can be reductionists as well, or we can be docetic, where we try to stay away from the messiness of material reality. But at our best, we should be interested at all levels of reality. And John Henry Newman calls for this in his idea of a Christian university. He believed that a university without theology doesn't quite live up to its name or vocation. It isn't able to provide a unified approach to knowledge. And so Newman viewed the task of theology in the university in part as that of, of helping the various disciplines to explore their limits, their possibilities, and their interrelationships. Uh, one theologian I want to mention tonight, the late John Webster, helpfully reminds us that human intelligence itself requires a multi-level description. He says, we have to detach ourselves from the assumption that the natural life of creatures is a secular life, cordoned off from God's presence and action. By naturalization, he goes on to say, by naturalization is meant the elimination of the category of creatureliness. Naturalized inquiry concerns itself with the elements of nature and culture, but not with their underlying principles, not with their creaturehood. So, instead of reducing the mind, say, to matter and chemicals in motion, Webster, I think like Alvin Plantinga, asks us to think about our minds as created by God for the end of knowing God. And he goes so far as to suggest 
that we'll come to a better understanding of human intelligence if we include theological categories such as created, fallen, and redeemed in our descriptions. Doing this, however, involves imagining the world and the mind, ourselves, as scripture imagines. That was a big stone, sorry about the heaviness. The second stone is a little smaller. Distinguish exegesis, the interpretation of scientific and textual data from hermeneutics, the principles of right interpretation. Now, my students don't often hear me agreeing with Rudolf Bultmann, but uh, I do at least approve his question. Is exegesis without presuppositions possible? Now, Bultmann, when he asked that, had biblical studies in mind, but I think it pertains to the sciences in general. Is scientific exegesis without metaphysical presuppositions possible? The philosophy of science, which we've mentioned, is all about analyzing these fundamental presuppositions. I don't want to dispute the exegetical results of scientists. If, if nature is a book that scientists read, I don't want to have to dispute their reading of the book, especially when it's a close reading. But I may dispute, or at least want to ask some questions about the principles they may use to interpret the data, because empirical observations are not self-interpreting. I don't think the Bible often gives science detailed instructions on their various domains, but it does address questions or assumptions that everyone, including scientists, have to face eventually about the nature of reality in particular, as well as questions about the meaning of life or the conditions for human flourishing. The Bible addresses those big questions. So it may inform science, not at the level of particular observations and data, but at the level of foundational assumptions, the hermeneutics. And when it does so, I think the Bible helps save us from reductionism. So let me move on to the third stone, the third smooth stone. Distinguish science from scientism, physics from metaphysics. I think people sometimes believe that just because science has proven so instrumentally successful that it must have privileged access to reality. I think this is a false inference. No amount of physics can establish a metaphysical proposition. They pertain to different orders of discourse. To think that physics can establish a metaphysical conclusion is to commit the most egregious error of all a category mistake. So by metaphysics, I am talking about the study of the nature of reality, the ultimate kinds of things that exist, the study of the general characteristics of being. Both physics and metaphysics are interested in the nature of the world, but physics and the other sciences are based on empirical observation and testing and things like that. While metaphysics pertains to these deep assumptions about what we are observing. You might say that metaphysics is the science of science, especially the science of science's unspoken assumptions about basic categories such as causality and existence. In saying this, I'm agreeing with Plantinga, who says that the real conflict is not between science and Christian faith, but between science and materialist naturalism. That is, the conflict is between people who think that physics can establish metaphysics. So the sciences have not and cannot prove metaphysical claims such as material naturalism. I'm, I simply am saying here that material naturalism isn't a scientific position. It's not something that science can establish. There are, however, people, naturalists or secularists, who do believe that all reality is this worldly, or that all reality is made up of physical particles. They've been with us since the ancient Greeks. We've had atomists in ancient Greece. But those who believe this hold to a faith 
It's a faith that all things can be explained in terms of material phenomena. And some people hold to this faith, this dogma, with great enthusiasm and try to explain everything, including religious belief and romantic love in terms of what's happening at the atomic level. But this faith is doubtful. In the words of Thomas Nagel, if one doubts the reducibility of the mental to the physical, and likewise of all those other things that go with the mental, such as value and meaning, then there's reason to doubt that materialism can give an adequate account even of the physical world. But there are some who try to reduce metaphysics to physics pure and simple. In doing so, they haven't escaped from metaphysics, they've simply jumped into one. I'm calling it materialist naturalism or scientism. It's an ism, an ideology, a faith, an unshakable belief in the omnicompetence of scientific methods. And it comes with a priesthood, the white-coated laboratory scientists. But scientism can't be proved by science. It's not a matter of physics, it's a matter of metaphysics or worldview. James Sire defines worldview as a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story or in a set of presuppositions that we hold about the basic constitution of reality. And that provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being. So I'm arguing that it's a category mistake to think that materialist naturalism and ideology can ride the coattails of science. It's a category mistake, but it's a powerful category mistake. A lot of people are deceived by this. So how do we approach the question of a person's worldview? How do you challenge a worldview if you can't do it through physics alone. And this leads us to uh, my fourth smooth stone. I think we need to acknowledge the formative influence of the social imaginary on our basic assumptions about what there is. Now, I may be off on this, and you can tell me if I am in the question and answer period. But I firmly believe that one of the most serious problems we're facing in our churches over these issues, this confrontation with the hideous strength of secularism and scientism, I think the problem is a failure of the imagination. I've written a whole book about this uh, called Pictures at a Theological Exhibition. The basic premise of my argument is that it's become harder and harder in the modern West for people to imagine biblical Christianity. But Einstein reportedly said that imagination is more important than knowledge. And if he did say it, I, I need to check this out to make sure that he did, but if he did say it, it would have been about the same time that T.S. Eliot was saying, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge whereas the knowledge we have lost in information. I'm concerned that false pictures have insinuated themselves into the evangelical imagination. I'm not saying that our congregations don't believe the Bible. I'm rather distinguishing believing in something and seeing by its light. I think our people want to believe in the Bible they're having a hard time seeing by its light. Merely thinking the right thoughts, having the right confessional statement, the right doctrines, doesn't necessarily generate a way of life. I think that's what Mitch was concerned about. How do you move from doctrine to practice? My concern then is that for many Bible-believing Christians, the Bible is no longer the book from which they take their existential bearings. Scripture's images, its metaphors, its stories are no longer the metaphors and stories by which people actually live. Now, I'm not alone in thinking that the imagination is a problem here. Uh, Charles Taylor in his book, A Secular Age, 
posits a connection between the rise of secularity and what he calls the social imaginary. The social imaginary is not a set of ideas, it's not a set of arguments, it's rather what enables the practices of a society. It's the story that people live by. And what conveys a social imaginary or a plausibility structure, if that is more uh, familiar to you, what conveys a social imaginary are not explicit propositions or explicit arguments, but these cultural pictures we live by. The rise of scientism and the loss of belief in God is not the result of some scientific discovery. Even if the cosmonauts did say they didn't see God up there, that wasn't what turned the tide. But there has been a tectonic shift of some kind. And I think the tectonic shift is a shift in those taken for granted assumptions that frame our everyday beliefs and practices. It wasn't an argument that uh, we heard, but for some reason, a new root metaphor has taken root. Not the world as God's good creation, but the world as, say, machine, or the world as organism, or something like that. So the picture that I think holds imaginations captive today, this materialist naturalism, it's not that people have argued for it, it's just that it's been communicated via many uh, lines in culture, in books, in newspapers, and so on. It's more felt than articulated. Taylor says, the way ordinary people imagine is often not expressed in theoretical terms, but it's carried in images and stories. Let me give you an example. Just a couple of weeks ago, I saw an article in the Chicago Tribune, and it was the title that caught my eye and made me choke on my toast. The article was entitled, Siri, Should I Believe in God? So I had my iPhone right there, and uh, Siri, should I believe in God? I'm really not equipped to answer such questions, Kevin. I, my Siri has a British accent. I think it makes her sound even more intelligent. <laughs> and actually, I give that answer high marks. I'm not equipped to answer the question. Good for you, Siri. This is humility. I mean, I like that. But apparently, other people's iPhones respond by saying, I believe in the separation of silicon and spirit. But the thrust of the article uh, was more serious. According to this article I read, our iPhones are getting smarter. They're acquiring smart content. Um, the result of, uh, sorry, the result of data collected from millions and millions of conversations. And the author of this article said, the companies in control of developing the content for complex questions, we'll find that the path of least resistance is secularism. In other words, this, this author is fully expecting Siri to begin giving more secular and more directly secular answers to these big questions of life. This creates a huge problem for the church. How are we going to preserve a Christian witness in the virtual square if smart content is created by people who marginalize religion and God? Who, who will our children believe? Siri or the youth pastor? So the takeaway from this fourth smooth stone is that pastors need not engage science head on, there's no need to do that, but indirectly at the metaphysical level, by using scripture to help congregations imagine reality in theological rather than merely secular terms. The gospel, you see, especially the announcement that God has raised Jesus from the dead, the gospel sets the captive imagination free. Eugene Peterson says something very similar about the function of the 10 plagues in ancient Egypt. He says, the 10 plagues, well, they did a, a few things, but one of the things they did 
was that they freed the imagination of the Israelites from thinking that the power of Egypt was invincible. The 10 plagues were an imaginative response to that hideous Egyptian strength. The plagues systematically deconstructed Pharaoh's power. But it takes imagination to see that what God is doing with a small tribe of slaves is greater than the might of Egypt or the grandeur that was Rome. But the Bible sets the evangelical imagination free to see and judge and act in faith, but in accordance with the way things really are, not the way secular science or Madison Avenue says they are. Who are we going to trust, Siri or Scripture? Now, I've been talking about the imagination in positive terms. That's because I think it's a cognitive faculty. It's what helps us grasp meaningful patterns. I dare say scientists like Einstein use imagination all the time. Analysis is reason taking things apart. Imagination is reason making creative connections, discovering things. The imagination is what allows us to formulate hypotheses. What if? But the Bible helps us imagine not what if, but what is. Faith in what is comes from hearing the word that captures the imagination. And so this leads me to the fifth stone. Insist that what is real is what gives itself to be known and that upon which we may rely. I've been saying all worldviews begin with faith. Uh, some belief about ultimate reality that can't be verified using scientific methods. Mary Popl Poplin, in her helpful book, Is Reality Secular, reminds us that fides, the Latin word for faith, uh, connotes trust and not simply intellectual belief. So let me suggest as my fifth stone that what is real is what gives itself to be known and, and uh, is what, uh, upon which we may rely and put our trust. Real things make a difference in the real world. This fifth stone is the one you can stub your toe on when you bump up against it. Because the real is what acts on the existence of something else, simply by being what it is. Entities, even stones, communicate more and more about what they are as we engage it, because the real bites back, it talks back, as it were. And the real can interrupt us as well. It can interrupt what we're doing when we first encounter it. Again, think of the stub toe. But what's real acts on us in ways that communicate what it is. The stone on which I stumble truly communicates to my toe what it is, if I'm alert and thinking about it. And by the way, that communication of the stone to my toe, that's another way of talking about what someone else has described as Thomas Aquinas's great central metaphysical insight, namely that reality isn't a matter of static substance, but active presence, active presence. Being is a verb, and what a thing does is it communicates what it is. Simply by being what it is, it communicates what it is. This applies, I think, to inorganic and organic things. Now, it also applies to God, but God is in an entirely different league. He's on an entirely different level than the rest of creation. But scripture shows us that God too makes himself known. God communicates his own reality in his own way. And God is ultimately real because God is active and present everywhere to everything and everyone at all times. Now, I need to do some more thinking about this, but often in theology and science, we hear about divine interventions, and that creates a lot of problems for people who don't want to think about God as a worldly cause. But let me suggest that instead, we think for a moment about divine interjections. 
divine interjections. To interject is to interrupt through abrupt address. Samuel, God calls us, God speaks to us. The Bible often depicts God's action in the world in terms of divine interjections. Let there be light. Well, that was an interruption. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That's an interjection of its own, the law coming into the human condition. Jesus' words, Lazarus, come forth. That's an interjection that causes something. And Jesus also says, peace, be still to the winds and the waves. And that in divine interjection made a difference as well. I want to suggest that God's word, his interjections, his speech acts, make the ultimate difference to our world. They've put it in motion, for goodness sakes. And this brings me back to Arthur Peacock, who says, to be real is to have causal power. But I say unto you, to be real is to have communicative agency. The real gives itself to be known, and we can rely on it if we've understood what has been given. Now, Jesus says, heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will never pass away, Matthew 24, 35. God's word is the ultimate reality. God gives himself to be known, and this word is deserving of our ultimate trust. God's word says how things are. There's a new book coming out. I just saw it yesterday by Cly Clyde Snodgrass, Klein Snodgrass. And I think it's called uh, Who God Says We Are. The thrust is that we are who God says we are. And I would say this is true of everything that is. Things are what God says they are. And wisdom is a matter of living along the grain of reality that we only know because God tells us. Wisdom lives along the grain of reality so that we're not constantly stubbing our toe but engaging rocks and stones in ways that help us to flourish. In other words, we have to adopt the right posture towards reality. We have to know it and we have to live in ways that uh, correspond to it. Here's a quote from C.S. Lewis from his The Abolition of Man. He says, for the wise men of old, the cardinal problem had been to conform the soul to reality. And the solution had been knowledge, self-discipline, and virtue. But for magic and applied science alike, the problem is how to subdue reality to the wishes of men. I don't think the best scientists are in the business of mastering the world. I think there's a genuine wonder and curiosity and maybe even stewardship that funds science. The best scientist gives real things his undivided, respectful attention. That's the right posture to have. Well, so should our attitude be towards the word of God, because heavens and earth may pass away, but God's word will not pass away. Pastors should be given their sustained attention to the word of God, because this is the one thing in the universe that is ultimately reliable. So I want, in conclusion, to encourage us all to take up, like David, these five smooth stones and confront the hideous strength, not of science, but of a reductionist scientism that threatens to take captive the imaginations of our congregations. And speaking of shepherds, David's example is instructive in one last way. He reminds us to fight the giant in our land, this ideology of materialist naturalism, in part by writing imaginative literature, poetry. Imaginative literature that enables us to see and feel and taste the goodness of God, his presence and activity in our world, and that allows us to taste and see the world as a good creation and ourselves as its pinnacle. 
O Lord, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? So David wields in the end not only five smooth stones, but 150 striking psalms, words that break into, wake up, and reorient our languid imaginations. But of course, not just the Psalms, but all the scriptures are profitable for training us to see the world and ourselves correctly, namely as beings created for a purpose. The Bible trains us to see things, not simply from a temporal point of view, but from the perspective of eternity. I like to call this the eschatological imagination. The Bible gives us the ability to see what is already but not yet there. The ability to see creation, our neighbors, ourselves, as entities in the process of being made new in Christ. This is reality, I want to say, even if I can't prove it by physics. The real makes a difference, and God's word continues to make a difference in our world, just as it did at the very beginning when it differentiated all things. So pastors, it may seem that you're Davids confronting these giant Goliaths of our scientific age, but it's the privilege and responsibility of pastors to say what is to wield the truth of God, the sword of the Spirit, and especially to say what is in Christ, the ultimate metaphysic. Preaching is a ministry not only of God's word, but a ministry of reality. Think about that from the pulpit, you're ministering reality, the words that will endure long after the heavens and earth have passed away. Because reality is not simply the referent of God's word, Reality is the product of God's word. God's word is the central thing. And it's the privilege and responsibility of pastors to take captive the social imaginary of their congregations. Not because you're fooling them, but because you're reorienting them to reality. And you can do this through through preaching sermons that rightly describe reality as it is and will be in Jesus Christ. After all, he is the one through whom and for whom all things were made. He is the one in whom all things hold together. So if certain factors in today's scientific picture appear contrary to the word of God, don't let that shake your faith. Faith has such confidence in the word that it can be quite open about its hesitations, its doubts, the things it doesn't understand, And faith can wait patiently for the clouds to clear. As God's word created matter, and then it set matter into ordered motion. And God's word continues to sustain every bodily motion there is. And God's word will the last day raise human bodies and set them in eternal motion. So make bold to proclaim this strong word and make an indelible difference to your congregation and therefore to the world. Thank you.